Hello, welcome to Gardener's World. Well, yesterday was the summer solstice. And although technically the days are getting shorter, in fact, we're now at this point, this plateau in the year, where summer just sits easy. And nowhere here at Longmeadow is more at ease with itself than the cottage garden. Because what you have is this lovely jumble of flowers, roses and lupins and clematis, foxgloves and delphiniums, all just gently jostling for space. And that's the key to this time of year. Don't hurry. Stretch out. Enjoy the garden at its finest. On tonight's programme, Arid Anderson explores a rain garden in Derbyshire that is helping us to protect against flooding. There are things you can do to absorb that water and slow it down, and that's what we're trying to put to people is something that we can all do to help that situation. We find out how Adam's garden in Lincolnshire is getting on and see the inspiration for his planned meadow. It's not just the individual species that I come up here to have a look at, it's the way the plants grow in the wild. And I shall be assessing the damage to my vegetable garden caused by rabbits. And also, I will be planting out tender animals into the jaw garden. I made a decision with these big pots here on the mound. I'm going to plant a small tree into them. And if you're going to invest in big pots like this, then it's worth investing in a really good plant to go in there. And I've got Cornus Cusa China Girl. It has these lovely white flowers, which come in May, June, and then in autumn, it has magnificent color, and also little strawberry-like fruits. They will grow six to eight foot tall with a spread that will be light and airy. But of course, if you've got a very small garden, with just a yard, you can still grow a tree in a pot. Now, Cornus Cusa likes good drainage, neutral to acid soil, but with plenty of nutrients. Don't skimp on the compost. I want this plant to look great in 10 and even 20 years time. So I've mixed up a special compost. The ingredients are garden compost, leaf mold, grit, and then a basic shop. Let's try that fight. That is pretty good. I don't want to plant it right to the brim because I want to leave room both to water and also to mulch it, and maybe even underplant it around it. Now ease it out the pot, and you just tickle the roots a little bit to stimulate fresh growth that will grow laterally out. I'm going to add some mycorrhizae powder in any woody plant. It just helps them get established, and the secret is to get direct contact so as well as spreading it on the surface like that, I'm also going to spread it on the roots themselves. Now, let's fill in around it. Let's just make sure that's firmly in. It's tempting when you plant a tree or a large shrub like this to start pruning, because after all, the shape is absolutely critical in this situation, as well as the flowers and the color. But wait for the first growing season. The next thing to do is water it really well and then mulch it. This is bracken. Pine bark would do just as well. And the reason I'm using this is because it's ericaceous. This will do two things. One, it will keep the moisture in. And two, as it breaks down, bracken is very high in potash, so it will add a level of feed. Whatever you do, don't mulch it with mushroom compost because that's too alkaline. Just keeping the mulch clear of the stem. And then water it once a week and add in dilute weed between May and September, and that should be very happy. I'm 
by the way, a very good way to know when to pot on a tree or a shrub is when it's healthy but has stopped growing. If by May or June there is no sign of new growth, that means it's run out of nutrients in the pot and needs to have a new one. Now, Carol has been to Spetchley Park in Worcestershire to celebrate one of summer's most glorious flowers, Pinny. Summer's finally arrived. There are leaves on the trees, everything's growing. And then suddenly, out of the blue, that's the buttercup family. There are two main types of flower. On the one hand, there are the from that woody structure. All of them have this slightly sort of glaucous touch to the leaves, very often pink tinged. And they have these huge, voluptuous flowers, sometimes single, sometimes double, sometimes somewhere in between. If you prepare your soil well, Plant your tree peony with care. It can... The most commonly grown of all these groups of peonies are the herbaceous peonies, which simply means during the winter they will die away to nothing. They'll disappear completely. Now, tree peonies have fibrous roots that spread out, but in the case of these, there are these big tubers. In the spring, up will come new shoots, and each one of them will make a big, tall stem with a spectacular flower at the top. But the whole deportment of the plant is beautiful. They're evenly spaced throughout, and even though their show lasts just a short while, they're spectacular when they're in bloom. They're very easy and straightforward to grow. But one of the complaints that people often have about these herbaceous peonies is that they refuse to flower. It's often when people have moved them, and the problem is that they get planted too deep. What herbaceous peonies need is to have their tubers planted so there's just a tiny depth of soil above them. An inch or two inches is ample. Any more than that, and they feel buried. They'll produce leaves, but very, very few flowers. And it really is worth treating them properly to get this spectacular display. This exquisite beauty is Paeonia laura dessert. She's a form of Paeonia lactiflora, the main herbaceous peonies that we grow in our gardens. In recent times, peonies like this have become incredibly popular florist flowers, and especially in bridal bouquets. No wonder, they're absolutely scrumptious. This is the third type of peonies that we grow in our beds and borders. It's an intersectional hybrid. It's called Bartsella. These peonies were introduced in the 1940s by Mr. Ito, a Japanese botanist, who wanted to marry the benefits of both tree and herbaceous peonies. He succeeded wonderfully, but he never knew about it because he died before the first ones flowered. Since then, they've become extremely popular because they don't need staking. They produce masses of glorious flowers and often that flowering is prolonged because they make extra buds too. What more could you want? The display that peonies provide may only be there for a short time, but whilst it's fleeting, there's nothing else like it. They're the true shooting stars of early summer. The peonies that I planted in these orchard beds three years ago are now hitting the mature stride. They're absolutely lovely. There are a pair of pink ones I particularly like. One is very simple, great for the bees, called Nymph, and behind it, Cerebernt Heart convoluted mass of petals, not so good for insects, but lovely for humans. Now, when the petals fall of any variety of peony, don't deadhead them or tidy them up, because the seed heads look like jester's hats. 
and they're really decorative in their own right. Very, very undemanding plants. You don't need to do anything to them. Now, if anybody thinks that Longmeadow is a paragon of the ideal garden where nothing goes wrong, everything grows as magnificently as it can, not a weed in sight, the soil is fertile, well, forget it, because we have the same problems as everyone else. These peas sown a month or so ago, which by now should be up here, we should be ready to start harvesting them. Look carefully, because you need to if you want to see anything at all. These have been devastated by rabbits, practically nothing left at all. If you look here, you've got the edamame, which I saw for the first time, were growing really well, eaten off by rabbits. And this all happened just in one weekend. Now, I like peas, I want them, so I am going to sow some more. It's very late to be sowing peas, normally it's something you try and do in March and April and maybe May for a late crop. So if you haven't done any yet, give it a go. We'll see between us if we get a decent crop before the end of summer, and I will use this ground for something else. I'm going to put my peas in this bed here. It's up off the ground, so that if I put a protective layer around the outside, it'll be difficult for rabbits to get at, and much more easy to protect. Now, I've got a variety that I've not grown before. It's called Eddy. I'm going to try it because it is specifically for late sowing. An inch or so apart is fine, but don't obsess over that. Here we go. Cover up the peas just by raking over. Now let's deal with the rabbits. This is chicken wire. Like that. And my cunning plan is to use canes and to thread it through. So and there like that and the rabbits can't chew through it and because it's a raised bed with paving right up to the edge they can't burrow under it and if I put it along the top they won't be able to jump over it so we'll just pull this round here this is not completely rabbit proof the main problem of rabbits in the garden is they take what's easy and nice for them so the idea is to deter them They'll find it difficult, and instead we'll go and eat my lettuce or something else. Now this is a temporary setup to let the peas get established, and I think once they are about two foot high, the rabbits won't bother them. Let's just hope we manage to get a crop, despite being late in the season, and also the one thing that peas hate more than anything else is very hot, dry weather. I don't very often water in seeds I sow direct into the soil because this is a wet place. However, I have noticed, as everybody else has done, that climate change means that we have longer periods of drought followed by really fierce, intense rainfall. And this pattern of rainfall has led to much more frequent flooding. And Eric Anderson has been to Derbyshire to find out how gardeners can help alleviate this situation. in the River Calm like this, but we all know that flooding is becoming more and more frequent. So the challenge is, is how do we lessen the flooding after heavy downpours? We need to use that rainwater, and where better than in our own gardens? I've come to the Strutt Community Centre in Derbyshire, where the Environment Agency has been working in partnership with the Trent Rivers Trust to create a garden that captures and uses rain. Not surprisingly, it's called a rain garden. Julie Wojnicka from the Trust has been part of the project to see how effective rain gardens can be. Julie, just what is the impact of these really heavy um, downpours that we're seeing? We've covered a lot of our land, especially in the towns, with tarmac and concrete, so the water goes really quickly to the rivers and then the river level 
levels rise. And also that water floods the sewage works and all the sewage comes out and it goes into the rivers and ends up in people's houses. Is there anything else that we can do? There are things you can do to make that garden absorb that water and slow it down. And that's what we're trying to promote to people is something that we can all do to help that situation. The average rainfall on a house is enough to fill just over one bathtub. If you think of a row of houses, that's a lot of water we can be saving and using in our gardens. Here, they've worked out a way to capture and distribute the water. Oh, that's gorgeous. Yeah, it was uh -huh. great, doesn't it? So what's happening is, and we've set this up really with a hose pipe to show you, but imagine that it's just tipping it down yeah. with rain everywhere. So all the water from that roof will be coming down this pipe and then it's, it's going into this channel, which is there to really soak up as much water as it can. The water from the roofs here doesn't end up in the sewers. Instead, it's channeled into a shallow trench. This runs into a gently sloping bowl at the bottom of the garden which is particularly effective at taking up water if there's a heavy downpour. This whole area makes the perfect spot for the right plants. And then you can plant plants that like those wet conditions, like irises, they're quite happy to have their feet in the water. Yeah. Astrantia over there, Alcamilla mollis as well, it really just likes those damp conditions. They're not plants that, that want to be damp all the time, they're just plants that can tolerate being wet some of the time and dry some of the time, and they're just happy like that. I can sort of already see how the plants are absorbing as it goes there's a little pool there but I can see it's already trickling through so you know simple principle but it really works it does, doesn't it an hour or so of rain and you'd really see it yeah. yeah Julie and the team have created a great space here for the public that demonstrates the principles of a rain garden hi hi hi, hi yeah. Yeah, pleased to meet you yeah. I've been invited by enthusiastic gardener Tanya to see how she is creating a rain garden few ideas of our own. Okay. Here we have the <laughs> garden in progress. Still a lot of work to do, but um, basically we wanted to use the principle of harnessing all the rain that falls on our garden footprint, even the hard surfaces like the rooftops. We've actually put in um, a guttering system and that takes the rainwater from the roof and ends up in our lovely oak barrel there. So once the water comes out of that barrel, where is it going? It will carry on through um, the little stream that we're going to create. Um, that will flow around the, all the planting scheme, around the edges of the garden, and then into the drop-off at the pool. There are a few things to consider if you are creating a rain garden. To ensure that all the water that's gonna come off of your house can now get absorbed into the garden, you do need to make sure that there's gonna be adequate drainage. One way to do that, dig a sizable hole, fill it full of water, know how much water you're gonna take a day. That way you can be sure that your garden can now absorb all of that extra water. Increased drainage, you can dig in some organic matter or grit to improve the soil structure. Today, I'm helping Tanya put some of the plants that will thrive in these varied conditions into the trench. So what have we got down here now? Okay, so we've got some marginal plants. Um, I wanted to put those in there because obviously they like to keep the feet wet and they're very good for water absorption as well. Okay. We've got a, a bottomless umbrella there um, and it's going to love being wet so that's going to be one of the main features for that. Is there an astilbe that I can see over there as well? Yeah I've got an astilbe just behind me here. Um, it does like its feet wet but it's quite happy just to have a moist well drained soil as well so yeah. that's why I've just got it a little bit further out of the edge on here. Then we've got the um, Calipha lustrous here. Um, again, that I'm going to bring into the marginal side of the stream right. um, just because again it loves to have its feet wet and it's just going the best plant to keep in a moist area. So it is okay. just thinking about getting those plants that can tolerate wet but not necessarily be wet all the time. That's right. It's also as well where we've got this mound, it's getting drier, the plants at the back. Yes, exactly. I've got a, a hebe here, um, variegated Aww. hebe, so we'll get some nice colour off of there and it's great to have a different kind of foliage in there as well. I mean, obviously these planting areas and capturing the rain is great, but I mean you've also even made your paths permeable, haven't you? Yes, definitely. I mean, we, we just felt that it was very important, not just to consider what we were planting into the garden to make it look beautiful, but also that any hard surfaces that we had are totally permeable, so that any rainfall that we do have is totally absorbed and there's no runoff at all. <laughs> and no, no way it can go anywhere else. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I'm not letting it.
this is where it's really important everybody doing it in their own garden yeah and it is so simple and if everybody did a little bit you know it would make such a difference make a start yeah like that i shall definitely be getting started in my garden <laughs> What I love about both of these gardens is it's shown me how simple it is to capture and channel free rainwater, add a bit of creative thinking and clearly some fun and you can have a fabulous rain garden. There's no question that the pattern of rainfall is affecting us all. And even in a very wet place like Longmeadow, we do try and conserve as much as we can. It, it's a good idea because when there are periods of two or three weeks without rain, then it becomes extra valuable. So if between us all we can do something, then maybe that genuinely as all part of the new herb garden. Now the new herb garden, I think, is coming along really well. It looks good. We use it all the time. And these are part of it. These are the boundaries. And what I'm doing to the limes is training them so that we just have a very rigid two-dimensional framework of three tiers of branches. And at this stage of the year, the important thing to do is just tie in the new growth whilst it's nice and soft and pliable, and then you won't break it. But wherever possible, if you're training branches horizontally, whether it's for espaliers or pleach plants, it's best to have it going slightly up rather than down. So this branch here, for example, I could tie in, but then it would be growing down. And there is another bud just below, so I'm going to let that develop. But whatever you do at this stage, don't tie in the very tips of the growth. So, for example, this, I've left the last six to nine inches loose, and that will naturally curve upwards. It wants to grow vertically, and that means it will have much more vigor. And when it's fully established, then you can tie it all in. And that applies to any horizontal training that you do. Now, all this process is part of a garden that has been evolving for the last quarter of a century and hopefully the next quarter of a century too. But Adam Frost only began his garden a couple of years ago. There's a lot to do, but he has done a lot already. And we join him as he looks back over the changes he's made and also at his plans for creating a wildflower meadow. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love this time of year. The garden's really coming alive. You might remember this area. It was one of the first areas I did in the garden, and it works really well. The plants is getting up, the wildlife's coming in, and I can sit and have a cup of tea in the morning. We've been busy over the winter. Also, I've got loads planned for this year, so I'll best show you around. Back in October, I was in there, in the mud, it was pouring with rain, and I was planting those wildflower plugs. I'll be honest with you, I haven't done anything else to it since, and then it's just amazing. Sometimes what nature does, and you just sort of let it go. Those foxgloves look fantastic. But there is another area in the garden that I've been putting a lot of work in, and I just want to add a few more bits in there today. Back end of the year, I was getting really frustrated with the herbaceous board. It just wasn't giving me what I wanted, so I ended up digging half of it up and moving it into places. It didn't have the sort of movement that I was trying to create. But now, I think I'm actually getting somewhere. And as garden sort of matured as the season has gone on it's starting to tell me what to do next can't do bang but in behind there i'm lacking some height so straight away i know that there's something that needs to sit in the back of there if you look here achillea quite soft and textured so the best thing i can do is look for a completely different foliage so something like this insomnia which has got a lovely sort of willow type leaf You see the contrast straight away in the foliage and that'll fill that space really nicely. And this valerium as well, it, it will seed a bit. So, you know, it, I do want this, I suppose, this space to take on a little bit of a life of its own as it matures. I think with this border, I'm more just trying to create, I suppose, like a tapestry feel. I want to sort of look along the border and not only have sort of movement going up and down, but have this constant change of texture and interest. Do you know, I promise that I'll only be out for half and three hours later, I'm still out here, so I'm not sure it'll ever be finished. This water was planted exactly 12 months ago, and some of it's gone bonkers. But the other thing that stood out for me in here is the lack of height in places. 
But instead of just planting something straight away, what I do is introduce canes at different punch points and move them around until I feel like they're in exactly the right place. Then I'll add a tree or even a large shrub. And you know, this silly little path idea has ended up being a really strong sort of design feature that's linking this whole garden together. I've got my bark path into this space, which is the brick, and then take me all the way through, which will be my new meadow. And then what's gonna happen is the mowing pathways are gonna work their way through and head to that beehive down there, which becomes the main focal point. You know, I want this to have a sense of place. I want it to sort of pull in real regional wildlife. And to do that, I've got to get out in the countryside and see what's growing around me. And lucky enough for me, just a couple hundred yards up the road, I've got someone that is stacked out with inspiration. I often come for a walk to this spot, Hills and Hole. It's a special area of conservation, managed by Natural England, with the support of volunteers. You know, I think this place is absolutely wonderful. And it's not just the array of wild flower, it's the sense of history. This was an old Roman quarry. And then after that, John Clare, the romantic poet, used to walk through here. And I want to take, I suppose, a little bit of that sense of history and romance and put it back in my orchard. So what I've been doing over the last 12 months is coming up here and just taking photographs of small groups of plants. So today, I'm up here to see how things changed. In spring, this place was covered in pulsatilla and primulas. Today, I've been given special permission to get up close to the plants, including one of the rarer ones. A couple of years down the road when I've established everything else. But look, there's a pulsatilla that I was telling you about. There's one still in flower, but the seed head looks absolutely fantastic. Loves really sort of hot conditions. So for me, it might, it might not work in the meadow. And then we look a little bit closer, Salad Burnett. That worked well in the orchard, definitely. But then you look, Breeza, which is the quaking grass. I think that'll all work really well in my garden because this is all on a limestone bed and I've got those conditions back at home. It's not just the individual species that I come up here to have a look at, it's the way the plants grow in the wild, you know? So you look at something like this philopendula, I've got a big group there, and then you've got these little seedlings that work their way off into the meadow and very much those ideas that will drive the way that I lay the orchard out back at home. But we have got to remember, I can't just come up here and dig this stuff up. You know, I've got to propagate it myself. But what I am hoping is that there is a fantastic mix of wildlife that uses this hills and holes. And I'm hoping some of that just goes a few hundred yards down the road to my place. Today, the first thing I want to do is field scapiest. There's some of it up there, and it grows really well on basically a lime-based soil, quite happily an alkaline as well. So I'm just going to soak those and let that compost really suck up. And then that will go into a greenhouse or a cold frame. Probably take two to four weeks to germinate, and then I'll prick them out. And I've got a load more of that to do between now and the end of the year. In October time, I'll plant the whole thing out. But that's not the only thing I've got planned this year. I want to put a gravel garden in at the front of the house, plant it up, but give us somewhere to sit. Not that I'll probably have five minutes to sit down. Anyway, I'll best get these in a greenhouse. We'll be returning to Adam's garden to see how that meadow progresses. The meadow can be very simple. This path has mown for over 20 years and yet this year I decided why don't we just mow the centre and let the rest grow and that's all that's happened. I think it looks great. Insects will love it and all you have to do is cut it at the end of summer, rake the grass up and then it will all start all over again next spring. Now still to come we visit a gardener in Gloucestershire who is attempting to recreate the collection of irises put together and bred by a member of her family over years ago. But first, Flo Headlam goes to London, where she helps out. Our towns and cities are ever-changing and growing, with new buildings springing up all the time. 
Yet there are thousands of unused and underused spaces full of potential just waiting for nature to get back in. All it takes is a bit of creative thinking and some good old fashioned elbow grease. In London 2013, a crack team of gardeners and designers came together to help communities transform forgotten back gardens into vibrant green spaces in just a day. They're known as the Perma Blitzers. With 64 spaces already blitzed in London, there's no stopping them. Today, I'm going to be helping the volunteers transform the much neglected garden of the Nubian Life Centre, a valuable resource that provides care for elderly African and Caribbean residents. As work gets underway, I catch up with head designer Kayode Ola Fimihan, who is the founder. So there's a lot going on. It's so busy here today, isn't yes. it? What's the concept behind it? Palmer Blitz London is a community network of gardeners and permaculture designers. We organise free days where people meet up, like today, um, to install edible, wildlife-friendly permaculture designs. And we do that at private spaces, uh, community gardens and public spaces. Uh, we do the design uh, and we supply all the people. And the recipient, they uh, feed us all. Yeah. Oh, so we're getting, <laughs> we're getting lunch today. We're getting lunch today. Right. And they cover the cost of the plants um, and the materials. But the big twist is, mm -hmm. is that once you've helped at three of these days, you can then have a perma blitz at your place. And if you haven't got a garden, then you can nominate one. So what's the plan for the Nubian Life Centre? A lot of the people who use this centre have dementia. So there needs to be a strong sensory aspect mm -hmm. of colour, bold shapes but also scent because mm. somehow the sense of smell takes you back to a place it does triggers memories yeah yes. we've got to finish at 5 30 today yeah. we've got this mad schedule so what are the jobs that we need to do today right so there's painting of the raised beds constructing the raised beds mm -hmm. we've got a miniature forest garden area to plant up yeah uh, there's a greenhouse that's being constructed so i can slot into one of the teams uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. So are you a regular perma blitzer? Very regular. How many of the 64 have you done? <laughs> I can't remember. I've been doing it for about two years. Okay. I started painting these with a paintbrush and a friend said, why aren't you using a spray gun? Mm. I love it. Can, can, I, can, I, finish, minutes, can yeah. I finish this one? Absolutely. Go for it. This is the perfect opportunity to speak with the manager of the Nubian Life Centre, Jazz Brown. What is the, the final garden going to mean to the, the residents here? It's going to mean so much in terms of being able to go outside, sit in the garden in the summer. And it's just been really amazing for us to be able to work with Perma Blitz, to be able to create this community asset, to create this space um, where people can learn about gardening, where people can just come and be quiet and just be still. So it's really hard to kind of say what the end meaning is going to be, because I think it's going to mean so many different things. One, two, three, four tons, four tons of soil to put into those beds. Go, 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 power, go on. <laughs> Impact. With so many plants going in fast, this garden is really starting to come alive. The patio area is now crammed full of bold colours and scent. It's simple, but it's genius. Whilst on the other side of the garden, designer and project manager Susanna Hall is leading a team creating a miniature forest. I noticed that some of the plants are in this area are edible. Is, was that deliberate? Yes, so the columbine, for example, has both edible flowers and leaves. The bugle or a guja here, yeah. Yeah, this has edible shoots 
will they be using them in the centre? This whole garden is going to be a community garden, not just for the users in the centre, but for people broadly in the community as well, both from an educational point of view and also to eat. What we find now as well is that we have plants that we know were planted in people's gardens, uh, community gardens, and we then can ask them whether or not we can have seedlings, whether or not they could propagate some cuttings for us. And it's a way that people who've had a pan of this can then give back. It's truly amazing what this inspiring group of people have achieved here today. And I'm going for another angle. Everyone has pulled out all the stops to help transform this garden and make a real difference to the lives of the people who use it. Yeah? Yes. Oh, it's a beautiful What do you think? Is it <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's more than what we thought. Thank you. It's too small a word. But I just hope that you can hear our hearts. Thank you. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm giving the olives that I planted the other day a very weak liquid seaweed feed. This is just to give them a boost, to get the roots nice and strong and also to encourage flowering. Now, if you are thinking of buying some olives and planting them in your garden, it is really important to make sure they come from a reputable source. And this is because there is a disease called xylella, which has wreaked havoc in the olive groves of southern Europe, and we do not want to introduce it into this country. And under no circumstances ever bring back plants from overseas because biosecurity is becoming an increasing problem. And we will be looking at Xylella itself later on in the series when Adam Frost talks to His Royal Highness Prince Charles about it. If you want more information about this disease and advice on biosecurity, then go to our website. And these plants here are fine, but it's going to give them a little bit more of a feed. And you only need to feed them once a week. As I say, it doesn't need to be strong. It's just a gentle top-up. When you're planting tender annuals, the idea is to add instant colour. This is late season stuff that is going to make the most of the heat of summer and only last until the frosts in early autumn. A bit of space here was filled with alliums. They look great. I've cleared those away. I've already planted canna and dahlia and an aeonium, which, by the way, will be perfectly hardy until the frosts come. And now I want to start adding in some sunflowers and some colour around them. And it just adds volume to the border. But as soon as they flower, we will cut them down and that will create space. So I want to be planting in amongst them to replace that volume. Now I have a tray of sunflowers. This is a sunflower called Claret. This is by no means the biggest sunflower you can grow, but it will grow a good six foot. That goes in there like that. And they will need staking, but not quite at this stage. Okay, now the next layer. This is a tray of Tifonia, the Mexican sunflower. They have an intense orange flower from July right through into October. It's one of the key plants here in the jewel garden. Now you can see this is looking slightly bedraggled. They can get mildewy when you're raising them, but don't worry, because once these go out into the garden and start to grow, they're completely healthy and will romp away. Now. In a good year, and a good year for Tithonia is a hot year, these can grow a good five foot tall. Bad year, about three to four foot. So they're what I call mid-story plants. So we can plant these nearer the back. Sorry. 
Okay, that's the mid layer. Now the front. Got here some centuria. This is Cyrenus burgundy, and you can see the color of the flower. It's a lovely, rich purple color. It's not going to grow very much bigger. I've sown these in paper pots. I will plant them in the pot, so I'll be interested to see how they develop. So we'll put a little group of these in here. So we're starting to build up a pattern. Sunflowers, they give us height at the back, tithonias in the middle ground, and then the foreground, the centuria. And as they grow up, they will fill this space, backed and working with the David Howard dahlia, the Wyoming canna, and the purple hazel. Now I've got one more tender annual I've grown from seed here, which I've got the perfect place for, and this is a zinnia. This particular zinnia is a giant scarlet, and as the name suggests, it's taller than many and is a bright red. Now zinnias, rather like tithonias, can be a little bit tricky to raise from seed because they don't like being too wet, they certainly don't like. Once they're in the garden, they're absolutely fine. It is too late to sow any of these from seed now, but the garden centers will be full of the perennials. Now, in theory, zinnias should have as much sunshine as you can give them. Certainly don't grow them in shade. Now, what I'm doing here is using a very restricted palette, but as wide a range of plants as possible. But for some gardeners, who are much more focused. It's the fascination with one species or a section of one species that really inspires. And we went to the Cotswolds to meet one such gardener who was also motivated by a family connection. My name is Anne Milner. I live in Gloucestershire near Sarancester and I hold the national collection of irises bred by a chap called Arthur Bliss. The flowers hold a special significance because Arthur Bliss was a very distant uncle of mine and I came across him when I was doing some family history research with a cousin who offered me a couple of his irises for my then quite large garden. We started finding out about them we started looking for a few more, and eventually they became a national collection. Arthur Bliss was an engineer. Uh, he retired early because he was deaf. I think because he was deaf, he kept himself to himself a lot. But looking at the photographs of his face, I would think that he was a very gentle, peaceful man who was prepared to put himself out for other people. Arthur was somebody who really didn't care about what he looked like or anything else. He didn't bother to buy new clothes. I think he was the worst dressed gardener, I think, ever. But on the other hand, his irises he kept in meticulous fashion and kept very precise records. In 1912, he moved from Kent to Malta. Therefore, was the start of his fame as an iris breeder. It's also the first iris that I got from my cousin. It's a very elegant iris. It's quite large for its age. It's um, this lovely, delicate, mauvey blue, and it smells simply wonderful. The most important flower in Arthur's story is Dominion. There is no doubt whatsoever about that because that forged his reputation and went all over the world for breeders to use to create new irises. Dominion was first introduced, it was so special that it was decided to sell it at five guineas a rhizome. In today's money, it would probably be about £300. And because it was so expensive, everybody then wanted it. If Velvety Falls, then Dominion will be somewhere in its parentage. Its influence is there right to the modern day. 
I started collecting these irises in the mid 80s. There are about 170 that he introduced and I probably have found about 35, 40 of them so far. And the hunt is almost as much fun as the growing. It's very important with old irises to make sure that they don't run into each other because it's important for me to keep each cultivar very clearly defined so that I know if I'm when I'm digging them which one's which. So I use scallop shells between each clump. And to keep irises healthy and not overcrowded you need to divide them. So you break the rhizomes apart. It's important to divide rhizomes so that the sun can get to the rhizome to bake them because otherwise they'll get overcrowded and they'll stop flowering. You then need to cut the leaves back. Some people cut the leaves back after flowering but it's not necessary because the leaves are busy feeding the rhizome and so the rhizome is growing bigger. You can also cut the roots back because most of the roots will regrow. It's important to name the rhizome as you do it Otherwise, if you're doing lots of irises, they can get in a muddle because all irises look the same when they have no flowers. People are beginning to use old irises in breeding again because a lot of modern irises have lost their perfume, they've lost their elegance and they want to try and breed some of that back into them. I do feel a connection to my uncle in that even though it's a very, very distant relationship, feel that if he was able to look down and see what was going on now, he would be really pleased. That I do think that our national collections, all of them, are treasures. And we should support them in any way we can, because not only are they a library of plants, but also they're accessible to all of us. I suppose most people don't realise that you can go and see them may have to make an appointment, but it means that you can go and see a particular plant or group of plants at a particular stage in their process, whether it be when they're flowering or just coming into bud or whatever. That means you know what they should look like. And that's very precious. Now, I know what these should look like. This is Allium Christophii. And the reason why I've grown these alliums in rows in this bed is so that I can cut them for the house because they're also growing in amongst the roses. But if you go and then pick them, it means that you're spoiling the display. Whereas these exist solely to be cut. Now these are whopping great alliums. You can see that they've got a huge head on them. But if I just take two or three for the house, they make a dramatic part of a display. Sorry, B, there are plenty more. Now, while I'm cutting flowers, there are a few jobs you can be doing this weekend. Now is the ideal time to sow Florence fennel for a harvest in late summer and early autumn. Either scatter the seed thinly on a seed tray or sow a little clump into individual plugs. But this clump will have to be thinned down to one seedling per Cover the seeds lightly, put them somewhere warm, water them, and grow them on steadily. At this time of year, apple trees will naturally shed excess fruit, and after the blossom we had this spring, we're expecting a huge harvest. But you should aid the process by reducing every little batch of fruitlets down to just two. This way, you will get quality as quantity. A lot of plants, like this Persicaria virginiana, have seedlings growing all around its base. If you dig up these seedlings, pop them on individually and grow them on, you can spread them out across the garden and get yourself scores of your favorite plants for free. We plan the colour scheme here on the mound with great care. We've only planted plants that are white, pale yellow, 
absolutely no reds or pinks of any kind whatsoever. Well, we have been colour bombed by opium poppies, and they are glorious. I don't mind them invading this space in this way. I think they look beautiful, but bees love them. And although they don't last very long, they leave behind these wonderful seed heads, which stay looking good right through into autumn. And so, surrounded by this chaos of colour, I'm afraid that's it for today. But I'll see you back here in a long minute next time. So until then, bye-bye.